Watch. Watch. Her next guest is bracing for a major pullback, and he sees the Delta variant playing a big role in it. Julian Emanuel is BTIG's chief equity and derivative strategist. It looks like maybe Julian himself is also at home, um, but working. Julian, great to have you with us. Thank you. How, how big of an impact is Delta variant to your view of the market? So I, I think if you think of it this way, Melissa, from our point of view, the market has shrugged off virtually all potential negatives. And here we are. Essentially, we all know that the last several days have had the highest degree of mobility, uh, certainly in the United States, since the pandemic began. Um, and what we've seen after spikes in mobility has tended to be uh, spikes in the, in the virus. So if you combine that with this idea that Japan is going to stage the Olympics uh, later this month, and what's really important is the potential reopening of the labor market in September when kids go back to school and at the same time that supplemental uh, unemployment insurance runs out, you have a number of events that, in our view, the market is pricing very favorably and really doesn't account for any potential uh, upticks in the virus that could sort of upset the, the apple cart of the series of events that we're about to have in front of us. We started the show with a question, Julian, and that is what what does the 10 year yield lowest level since February or so tell you um, and couple this with, of course, markets sitting pretty much at record highs across the board. What do you think uh, the message is? The, the messages are somewhat mixed. And, and actually, if you think about it, that is consistent with a market that, in our view, is likely to take a pause with, within the context of a market that, looking at a year or two from now, is likely to be substantially higher than where it is. And so if you, if you go back to when yields topped at the end of March at around 175, what we saw was strong buying by international investors. Uh, into U.S. fixed income, essentially, in our view, because those are the type of people who really haven't seen the end of the virus crisis uh, to the d extent that we have. Obviously, vaccination has been very good uh, in the U.S. And what we've had was, in the wake of the Fed's announcement uh, at, at the last meeting, uh, the expectation that there might be a taper, which sent the yield curve flatter, sent 10-year yields lower, which ha obviously haven't recovered from there. The combination of that and uh, the fact that, again, we do have a potential headwind uh, with regard to public health in, in the coming weeks has caused pressure on yields. We would agree with uh, what uh, a number of, of your panelists uh, have said, is that if yields start to drop uh, significantly lower than this 135 support level, that's likely to be a further negative for stocks. So, Julian, you and I talked about that cyclical basket months ago. Where are you on the last wave or the last push for small caps or value stocks uh, per se? So we actually think, Steve, again, the, the things that we're talking about are, are near to medium term headwinds that likely end up being resolved once we get through the fall. Um, and certainly looking into 2022. And if you think about it, is, is that a bull market cycle, which we think began new a year ago, 15 months ago, and that could run uh, as much as, if not more, than the average 154% gain of, of the bull markets of the last 100 years. To us, the leadership is likely to be reasserted in the value names, in the deep cyclicals, and in the small caps. Julian, I'm, listen, I love your work, obviously, just to play devil's advocate. If the yields were to fall, my sense, my sense is it would continue to be a tailwind for some of these mega cap tech names, which have basically been driving the broader market. So how do you wrap your head around a move lower with mega cap tech potentially breaking out to the upside? You can certainly make that argument, particularly if you look at the script from last year, because that's exactly what we saw is that basically – um, regardless of how yields were fluctuating in, in the near term, uh, the, the, the reopening was delayed. Uh, money flowed into uh, NASDAQ, FANG, et cetera. We think the, the narrative is somewhat different because if you think about it, what you were seeing was earnings growth that was absolutely unprecedented, totally unprecedented, 30, 40, 50 percent um, in, in various stocks. That's behind us. And if we got some sort of uh, uh, 
further work from home type of situation, which again is not our base case. We're looking forward to being back in the office after Labor Day. Uh, that is not likely to be the kind of tailwind for these stocks simply because even though they're secular earnings growers, the mm -hmm. best earnings growth, the true huge surprises are in the rearview mirror. Your top areas, Julian, healthcare, energy, and crypto exposed stocks. Crypto exposed stocks. There aren't too many out there. Can you enlighten us as to what you mean by this? Just a handful. Uh, there's several uh, publicly listed uh, uh, brokerages. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, there's uh, a, a company or two who's uh, made very public uh, their own investment in terms of their treasury uh, in crypto. And, and basically what it comes down to for us is we continue to believe. And if you think about the inflation narrative in particular, a story which we would agree is not finished at this point. If you think about that narrative, the reasons for owning crypto, diversifying the portfolio, whether it's uh, the crypto them itself or derivatives, meaning equities, is very, very compelling on a long-term basis. Uh, again, we were not sort of taken by the momentum into 64,000 several mm -hmm. months ago. Uh, we also think, similarly, that the recent weakness is a buying opportunity, and we th see this area as very attractive going forward. Julian, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Julian Emanuel, BTIG. By the way. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.